fun. <laughs> it's it's very nice how the entire class is localized. And like, you know, <laughs> yes, indeed, you're very. It's a very bosonic class. Um, to the to this is essentially the last lecture of quantum thermodynamics. Um, so next week we do a little bit about uh, measurements, um, and then you then it's Easter break and you move on to the the blocks of uh, Philip. And uh, so in fact. Today's lecture will really be probably the, well, in a sense, maybe not the most quantum of the quantum thermodynamics block, but at least the one that deals with coherence and correlations the most. So the first part of the lecture I want to discuss, I want to continue the topic of erasure. Um, and just to summarize, so everything we discussed in the last week was could boil down to the fact that if I had, let's say, a bit of information that I wanted to erase, so as a physical system, this would be, oh, there's a state um, there's a qubit in the maximally mixed state, and I want to bring it to a pure state. Then there is a bound on how much, um, what's the minimum work I need, or the amount of stuff, uh, energy I need to dump in a bath in order to get this done. And of course, the other way around, and we discuss generalizations of that. So now let me go back to the very basic task. I, I want to take um, a qubit from a maximally mixed to a pure state. But what we're going to consider now is that, in fact, this qubit is part of a joint system. So it could be correlated with something else. Um, and we call that the memory. So there is a general statement, but I'm going to do the example of just a qubit first. And here it will be two qubits. Uh, and then discuss what the general statement is. So here's our setting. So we have uh, our system. So S is our system. And then we have a M, which we call the memory. Okay. And S is what we really want to erase. So this has to be erased. And I'm going to consider three cases. In every case, rho S is identity over two, and we really want to take it to the pure state zero, zero. Okay. So now, case one. So. This is, so one is that rho S and memory together is given by the product identity over two, hence uh, identity over two, okay? Um, case number two, oh, and uh, there's not gonna be any Hamiltonians in this example. So all of them are, are degenerate systems. There's no energy involved here. Well, other than the energy of the bath. Uh, in case two, the system and memory are correlated. And so we have uh, one half um, zero, 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 plus one, 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 one. Uh, energy system, memory, system, memory, system, memory. And in the third case, they are entangled, so one, uh, still one over square root of two, so just write it as phi plus, phi plus, where of course, phi plus is equal to one over square root of two, zero, zero, plus one, one. Okay. Now, what you see in every one of these three cases is that if you take the trace, so of course here it's trivial, if you take the trace of system of memory, it's a tensor product state, they're both in identity. But the same thing holds true for the second and the third case as well. In both of them, if you were to trace out the system to get the memory state or vice versa, you would always see that every one of the reduced states in all of the, these three examples is just the maximum mixed state. So they're always in the maximum mixed state. Okay, now, so the point to be made is the following. So if we were to consider the original problem, identity over two has to be raised to zero. Then I just get, so I know, so the original work that has to be done is KT log two. So without the memory. Okay. Now the point is that when you have the memory as well, if you only care that the system has to be taken to that state and you don't care what happens to the memory, things start to change in cases two and three. Now, one of the ways of looking at this is, is the following. So in case one, if you, if you were to calculate the entropy of each of these cases, let me put that in a small box here. 
Here the entropy is two times log two. So two bits, so to speak, because you have two maximum mixed states. Here the entropy is only one bit because I'm really, I, if I look at the entropy of the joint state, I'm in a mixture of two equiprobable states. So here the entropy is one bit, so it's just log two. And finally, in the last one, I'm in a pure state. So here the entropy is zero. Okay, And this already gives you a hint, because the whole point of erasure is to take something from a, a higher state of entropy to a lower entropy state. So even though the reduced states are identity over two in every case, the actual entropy of them differs. So you should be able to use it. So now, what do we do? So in case one, there is nothing really that you can do, because you are in a tensor product state, so the memory doesn't tell you anything about the system. The thing you do is the original erasure. which means w is kt log 2. In case 2, now here you can do something interesting. So yeah, so you have that the, the system and memory are, are in a mixture of these two states. But now you can consider that because the entropy of them is actually one bit, you could concentrate that entropy on one of the systems or the other. So in principle, I could make a unitary operation. So let me consider the unitary operation that takes so it takes the state, um, so u acting on 1, 1 is, uh, is equal to 0, 1. 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. OK, so this is a unitary operation. So of course, I can complete the unitary operation. So I could do u acting on. One's, um, on 0, 1 is equal to 1, 1. And then it leaves the other two unchanged. So u acting on um, 0, 0 is equal to 0, 0. u acting on 1, 0 is equal to 1, 0. This is a unitary operation. Now, what happens if I do this unitary operation here? So I put u, u dagger on, I, on, on each of, well, on the full thing, which means I can do it on each term. The 0 doesn't change, and the 1, 1 changes. So then what I get is that row system memory prime is half 0, 0, 0, 0 plus 0, 1, 0, 1. But this is now back again a tensor product. This is the state 0, 0, tensor identity over 2. Now, I'm going to already label this thing. This is what is generally referred to when you read papers about this topic as compression. Because what you had is you had some information property like entropy in this case. And on a on a system that was very well, it was it was very composite. And then you chose to sort of compress. You said, well, let me make one of them as pure as I can and one of them as high entropy as I can. So you basically compress the entropy onto a shorter sequence. And now this is already erased. So We've done it. So here we, we, we haven't re required a bath. We haven't required any energy to be spent because we've all, we've got what we wanted by just doing a unitary operation. So this is the case number two. And now you can already guess what happens. Yeah, what, go on. What if, depending on what system, but what if that unitary had an energy cost because we're swapping two states that might not matter the same? Yes, so this is why in this, in this example here, I'm dealing with energyless memory. So these are now, there's no Hamiltonian involved. So yeah, but in general, of course, yeah, if there are Hamiltonians involved, then it's different. But just focusing on the entropy cost, I can see that, yeah, we can, and yeah. Related to that, mm -hmm. I guess it would probably have an effect on the energy ratio without memory, but is it possible for the unitary to become more expensive once we add a Hamiltonian? Yeah, yes, then yes. But then then what you would just, yes, more expensive or less expensive, depending on, on what, okay. how you use it, yeah. So, so typically, that, so the thing is, um, so this is true, but, but um, what I would say is that typically when you consider just information processing, there's no reason for the memory states to be energetically different. So typically they're all the same, but uh, because then, I mean, then the whole thing becomes about cooling rather than erasure. But uh, indeed, it's, it, it's true that what you said is true. If there's a Hamiltonian, then the unitary has some energy cost, but yeah, it's not, uh, yeah. Um, okay. Now we consider case number three. And 
What do you do in case number? So in case number three, actually, you can do the similar trick now. I have a I have already a pure state, right? So I can simply in, instantly do the unitary that just changes five plus five plus to the zero state. So I just go with the unitary operation. I take five plus by unitary operation to the zero zero state, and I'm done. I'm I, I have got it erased. But now comes the in, important part. If it is really the case that the memory is not important and Let's let's point out something different. If I was to take any one of these um, cases here, and I was to ignore the fact that there's a memory and just do erasure with the bath, so I would like interact with the other devices and erasure with the bath, I would lose all of the correlations and the entanglement that it has with the memory because I would interact with the with the bath and the other systems. So in every case here, the memory would be left in the maximally mixed state. If I was to ignore what it was, right? So now, if I want to compare what I can do when I know what the memory is, this is, not all, this is actually not a fair comparison because what I've done here is with a unitary operation, I have erased my system, but I've left the memory in actually a much better state. It's also a pure state. So what I could do to compare it to the original case of ignore the memory is I could say now, extract work from the memory and leave it in the state zero, zero, tensor identity over two. So I basically use the fact that the memory is a pure state to extract work. So I do the reverse protocol that we discussed yesterday. And, and this means that W is equal to minus KT log two. Oh, sent it the wrong way. I will pull that one down, pull this down. Now, another way of looking at these three examples and seeing what it really is different uh, between them is by looking at the conditional entropy. So the entropy of, of H of the system, uh, I write H well, okay. For this lecture, I'm gonna write H because it's just standard, even though it's usually we've been using it for Hamiltonian, but I'm not gonna deal with Hamiltonians yet in this lecture. So uh, H, so I write H of S given M, okay? So this is really the, the quantity that describes how much entropy the system has when we have the presence of a memory. Given the memory, how much is the entropy of the system, okay? So in case one, this was exactly the same. This was log two. In case two, this was zero, because given the memory, if you know whether the memory is in zero or one, you instantly will know what the, the system is in. In case three, this is actually negative of log two, and this, is particularly a quantum phenomenon, the negativity of the conditional entropy. Okay. And so in fact, now I can actually state what the, the general thing is. So what we ended up doing is we ended up extracting an amount of work that was equal to, oh, sorry, we ended up needing work that was equal to KT times H of S given M. So now when, that, when there is no M, then this is just entropy of S, which is delta S, KT delta S, which is the exactly the thing that you've learned the previous lectures. But now with the presence of a memory, you have H of S delta M. So the paper that sort of described this um, in detail uh, is called the thermodynamic meaning of negative entropy. It is a paper by the QIT group in, so 2011, it's actually a, it's your paper, so and okay, now this is of course the statement that I made here. This is true for this very nice example. And the reason is because the state is such that there's a very simple unitary that can do it, and so on and so forth. If I started with a general correlated slash entangled state between system and memory, you don't always get exactly this. So what you can show is that if you have multiple copies of it, then you can do it because what you do is you work on the joint system. So essentially what doesn't work as cleanly is the compression of um, the compression step where you take a unitary and then you compress all of the entropy into one. So that really manages to do it 
manage this to be optimal only when you have multiple copies because then you really have multiple subspaces and you can really computationally do the best thing. Uh, for a single shot uh, uh, case, this is not always true, unlike the examples above. So what you get then is that W, the, the work that you will have to put in, in general, is upper bound. And here they are, uh, there is a H epsilon max. So this is one of the smoothed entropies I was talking about yes, uh, yesterday. Yes, it was yesterday. I'm not going to go into detail again. Plus delta, which is an error that depends on epsilon. AT log two. So it always has a similar form, but depending on how close you want your final state to be to the to the pure state that you want from iteration stuff, this this is going to change. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Indeed. Yes. You're not you're not going to get a. Uh, extractable work if you do not have the entanglement. Yeah, you can get a zero from classical correlations, but not, not more. Yeah, indeed. So that is a yeah, uniquely quantum feature. Okay, are there any questions? One. Oh, that's very early. Um, okay, so let's now move on to the second part of the lecture, which is somehow very similar to what we did last time, but it's. Uh, a slightly, well, there's coherence involved in, in addition. So a lot of the, well, actually almost all of the stuff that we've discussed so far deals with incoherent thermodynamics. So even in the, in the well, okay, most of the stuff we did was incoherent thermodynamics. We talked about working in degenerate spaces and et cetera, et cetera. And then in the last lecture, we, we said, oh, imagine that I have um, a unitary that I want to do, but I want to actually do it with the, with the, um, with an explicit work source, and we included the work source. But the unitary that we did yesterday, we still um, we still consider the case of a, a swap between. Uh, we considered a full swap between two energetic eigenstates. So we went from one energy eigenstate to another. So now what I want to do is I want to say, well, imagine that you have an arbitrary operation, one that actually involves the manipulation of coherence. So as an example, so the operation we're going to consider is that we have a system. And this time, H is a Hamiltonian. Um, and I'm going to take HS is the usual. It's a qubit. E, 1, 1. OK? And I start with my state of the system to be psi of S is 0. And I want to transform it by a unitary operation to the state plus. 0 plus 1 over square root of 2. OK? Now, OK, clearly, we, I mean, we know what unitary does this. So we can say, so we can write down the unitary. 0 plus, for ex this is one, one example that does it, plus 1 minus. You can add a phase, I guess, there, and nothing would change. Um, but this is, of course, not energy preserving, because 0 and plus it's not just that zero and plus don't have the same energy, it's that plus is actually a coherent state in energy. It has the superposition of two eigenstates. So now I can split this, uh, the reason for which would become clear. So I write this as one over root two. I, I split plus and minus in terms of the energy eigenstates. And so I get zero, zero, plus one, one, plus uh, zero, one, minus, one, one. Okay. Why did I do this? Well, each of these, uh, oh, something has happened. No, this was zero, one, sorry. Zero goes to zero plus one, one goes to zero minus one. Yeah. Okay. Now, each of these terms has a definite energy difference. So, what am I going to do? I'm going to do exactly the same thing that we did last uh, yesterday. I'm going to turn this into an energy preserving operation by involving an explicit work source that is going to provide the energy difference in these two terms. Now, unlike yesterday's where I considered a very idealized work source that had uh, a continuum of energy states, here we don't need a continuum. So I'm going to take H of the work source to really have this energy gap. So it's going to be sum from minus infinity to plus infinity. Of course, this is, again, as you already looked at in Patrick's lecture, it's not physical, but 
We're just going to assume it's large enough so that the boundaries are not so important to us. I will discuss the boundaries in a bit. Uh, minus infinity plus infinity. And it's just, so that's E. I make this as well, E. N times E N N. This is my Hamiltonian. So the energy gap here is exactly the same as the energy gap of the qubit. Uh, and for this, I have the, the, the raising operator, which is the, the usual. So sum over N, N plus one from N. And so how do I make this energy preserving? I do the same thing as yesterday. So I say, for this, you need no energy. So I do nothing on the weight. For this, you just also need no energy. So nothing on the weight. And for this, you need energy. So you lower the weight. So gamma, the, inver the inverse of gamma is the lowering operator. So gamma dagger and gamma plus minus are the same. So here I can say I need to raise the weight. So that's gamma dagger. And here, uh, sorry, here I, here I lower the weight because I have the weight is to provide energy, whereas here the weight gains energy, so it's gamma. Okay. And so the, for, for the final ingredient here, because we want to see how well, so already in yesterday's lecture, you, you saw the fact that the weight does better if it's a broad state rather than a pure state, so we do the same thing here. But now here, I take a coherent state, so I say that um, the starting state of the weight, so I call it phi weight initially, is one over square root of d. It's a sum of d states. So n is equal to, let's just for simplicity take zero, to d minus one of n. Okay, so this is a coherent state. And now I do this. This is my initial state of the weight. This is my initial state of the system. I do the unitary, which I've now made a unitary on both the system as well as the weight. What are we going to get? Uh, oh, let's do it here. So uh, my final state is going to be, so already you can see in the unitary operation that, um, okay, these two terms in the unitary are not going to matter because the system is in zero and these only act on one. So it's really all about this. So we're going to get that this final state, and it's going to be a pure state. So the final state of system and weight is going to be, one over square root of two, zero tensor phi weight. That's what happens with this term. And the other term is going to be plus one tensor gamma dagger on phi weight. Okay. And like we did yesterday, we are interested now in two things. So one is we are interested, so how close, so how close is is rho s prime to our target state, which was plus plus. The second is how degraded is the work source, is w, okay? So one way of writing this is to say rho s w is equal to, and I use the same block uh, notation that I did yesterday. So I, this is sort of a qubit density matrix within which each block is, of course, the Hilbert space uh, is the density matrix of the, of the weight. So in this block here, in the zero, zero block, I have one over two, phi weight, phi weight. Here I have one over two, zero with one. So it's gonna be phi weight, by weight with needed more space, uh, gamma, because it's the complex conjugate. Uh, here it's going to be, of course, the opposite. So it's gamma dagger, by weight, by weight. And here it's going to be half gamma dagger, phi weight on gamma dagger on both sides. Ah, sorry, it's just gamma. Thank you. Yeah, conjugate of gamma dagger. Yes. So now when I trace this out, so I trace out the uh, the weight in each place. What am I going to get? So rho system prime is going to be, in this case here, I'm just going to get half because this is just yeah, this is a pure state of the of the um, 
off the weight, so that's fine. Here as well, I'm just going to get half. But in here and here, I'm going to get something different. So actually, let me just put the half outside because it repeats everywhere. Half times one, one, phi weight, gamma dagger, phi weight, and the complex conjugate, phi weight, gamma, phi weight. Okay, so this is now a critical quantity, which we can actually use this little space that I have to calculate. So what is phi weight? gamma phi weight. What happens when I do, I, I raise gamma, so I can put that here. So if I raise the weight, then I get exactly the same distribution, but now from n is equal to one to d of n. So when I take the inner product between these two, we see actually all of, there's a very, well, there's all of the states from one to d minus one are common. So they will all uh, combine to give me one over d, each of one of them. The only things that don't participate in the overlap, which are orthogonal, is the n is equal to zero state here and the, uh, the, the d state here. So what I'm going to get is d minus one times, I'm going to get the overlap, well, one over square root of two, one over square root of two becomes one over d, and plus one time, I'm going to get zero because there's no overlap between the n is equal to zero state and anything here. So this is just d minus one over d, which is one minus one over d, okay? That's close to one, but by d. Okay, so this is one minus one over d, which actually is nice because now I can write this in a in a in the this following form. So I can write one minus one over d. It's really the state one 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 and one. So that's plus plus with the half, of course, outside. But with one over d probability, I didn't get anything here and here. I only got the half and the half here. It's identity over two. Okay. So, okay, it's not surprising here, but it's just an explicit demonstration. If my state was coherent with many energy levels, then I get something close to what I would like. And the closeness really depends on the width of this coherence. Okay, um, right. And so now for the next thing, I see what, what happened to the weight. So what is rho of the weight? So then for that, uh, it's basically a mixture because I'm in zero or one. Yes, so when we trace out when we trace over the system, the only things, if you look at that block diagonal, the, the off diagonal blocks go away and the only things that remain are the, the on diagonal block. So what I get is that rho weight is an equal mixture between phi weight, phi weight, and the other state is uh, gamma dagger phi weight, phi weight. Now, I'm not going to do this in detail, except to point out now that, again, as you see there, gamma phi weight, actually, this might, is it exactly the same thing that you had in the tutorial yesterday? Or no, that was a continuum Hamiltonian, yes? The weight was a continuum Hamiltonian between L minus L and L. Okay, so this is a discrete one, but the same principle applies. So if I was to look at, for example, the entropy of this weight, um, it would be something that was very small, and we could bound how large it can be by the number d. So as d becomes larger, the these two states get closer and closer to each other. So even though it looks, looks like an equal mixture of two things, note that um, they're very much not orthogonal. It's the opposite. They're very close to each other. So actually, this is still very close to a pure state. But it's close, so it's close to the a pure state, depending on d. Okay. 
So what was all of this to say? So in order to do coherent thermodynamics, in order to go from a state, an energy eigenstate to, a, to a, another, let's say, a, a state that has coherence in energy, you need as a resource that your whatever source of energy that whatever thing that provides the energy for this transformation also must have coherence. If you don't do that, you cannot end up with coherence between the energy eigenstates. Okay. And now, so this is an example of a of a work source that would do theoretically arbitrarily well. So this this particular work source is discussed in very great detail in a paper by. Aberg, so it's Johann Aberg in, uh, I forget, it was 2014 perhaps, it's a, it's a PRL paper there. And uh, I think the name is, Catalytic Coherence. And so there are two ways of looking at this result, um, which are both sort of equally important, but one should not forget the other one. So the first way is the following, if I have, that, that's gone. All right. So if I have any state transformation that I want, and now I use the example of uh, a qubit from zero to plus, but you see with the with the protocol that we have, we can do this for anything. So I take any unitary that I want, arbitrary unitary, and all I do is I write it in the energy eigenbasis. And when I write it in the energy eigenbasis, every term will be of the form EI going to EJ. And so then when I include the work source, I know how to make this energy preserving. I just tensor product that with the translation on the work source that plugs the energy gap EJ minus EI. So that's a protocol that would work in general. And so I can then again use this edge weight and I can do effectively any transformation in this, in this form. And so what you see is that the main thing to worry about is the width of the energy. So the, the, if the work source is a superposition over many eigenstates, the main thing to worry about is the width of that superposition versus the amount of energy I have to transfer due to the, the protocol. So here, this was one in the case of the system and D in this case, but this could be two arbitrary numbers. And so what everything that we did, we're going to get a similar result as long as the width of that one, the, the width of the, so the amount of energy that we have to give to the system is much less than the, um, the sort of width and energy of our, of our coherent work source. Okay, so in that sense, one mathematical statement one can say is given any state transformation with any uh, finite Hamiltonian, one can always find, so let's put it this way, given any, well, let me write it down in full, so given any, I say finite HS and let's say psi S comma psi S prime and, and allowed error epsilon. And what do I mean by allowed error epsilon? So for example, that we want that rho s prime, the actual final state from my operation, the trace distance from my desired final state, for instance, is less or equal to epsilon. So this will be an allowed error. You can find, you can find a coherent work source um, that, that works. So that is good enough. So in this case, for example, you could you could just say, well, I, I can, whatever epsilon I have, I know that my D has to be of order, basically epsilon inverse, because that's the error in this case. Okay, so this is one version of it, but there's the other version, which is also equally important because what happens when we use the work source, right? So when we use the work source, in, in this case, we only either kept it the same or we uh, raised it, I guess. Did we raise it? No, we should have lowered it, sorry. Ah, sorry, I, I, I did the calculation on gamma phi weight, but actually what we have is a lowered work source. Ooh, this is gamma dagger. Um, but in general, if I have a more, if I have an arbitrary um, unitary transformation I wanted to do on my system, my work source is going to go into a mixture of, of various things, the original state plus some raised, some lowered. So this means that the work source is going to degrade. So now I, I shift to the opposite picture. I say, imagine I have a fixed work source. Then what happens? Then as I use this, for single or multiple unitary transformations, the work source is going to be gradually degraded to the point where one of two things can happen. Either one, it becomes such a wide mixture that the width of the states now compared to the to where, um, where the energy is in, it, in the mixture has now become small. So I would have, for example, 
a mixture of the state of the work between zero, like between 100 and 200 and between zero and 100. So then they're completely disjoint. Sorry, you have a... Oh yeah, sorry, it is without lag. Oh, this is why. Yes, thank you. <laughs> because gamma is related to is inverse by the dagger, I, I keep uh, thinking, so thanks, yes. Um, yeah, so if I, if I use the work source repeatedly, then eventually I could always get to a point, just given enough, unit, enough system transformations that I want, that the work source gets degraded. It's sort of moved disjoint into a disjoint energy space in some of the mixtures. That's one of the things. The other thing, so the degradation of the work source is in two parts. So one is just that the, um, so for instance, I will have some phi weight, phi weight, and I have some, let's say gamma to the n phi weight. So let's just say I have phi weight and gamma to the n phi weight, where n is greater or equal to d, then that will mean that now phi weight, gamma to the n phi weight is zero. So if I raise the if I raise the weight more than d times or d or more times, then of course I get an orthogonal state. So all of those those errors would now become well, basically one. I, I'm I'm guaranteed not to get the correct answer in that case. So this is one way it can degrade. The second way it can degrade is to run out of energy. And what I mean is, so just for simplicity, I put n going from minus infinity to infinity in that example. But technically, in in practice, what I would have is there's going to be a ground state of the work source, right? So when I start the work source, tip, what I would ideally ha like is that the work source starts in a distribution that's far away from the ground state. So it's able to move up, it's able to move down, and able to stay the same. But again, eventually, if I do enough unitary transformations, there might be a property that the work source has gone to the bottom. And at that point, it can no longer give energy. So if I do this, um, this procedure, there are going to be some elements with, the, with gamma dagger, where I lower the weight, which is just not going to work. Because gamma dagger on a, on a ground state is just going to give you the ground state again. It's, well, it's not, well, it's going to destroy the ground state, so that's not going to work to um, transfer energy to the system. So the other way you can do is, you can find is you can run out of energy. And so this results in the statement that that's the, sort of the converse of this. So given any, and, I, and I'm not really, these are not really very, I mean, this part is technical, but the, 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 the statement here, when I say good enough and stuff, I haven't made them technical, it's more conceptual. Given any work source, or finite work source, I should say, so somebody says there is a D dimensions for it, over which you start, it will eventually, eventually degrade. So this is the thing about doing coherent thermodynamics. Um, coherence is really a separate resource to energy. Uh, and the, the conversion between them is not, at least in my experience, is not entirely clear. Um, because of course we do in the lab, we work with coherent states and energy uh, a lot. But then when we do abstract thermodynamics to actually manipulate coherence is a very tricky business. It's very important to define everything correctly so that you don't end up cheating, for instance. Um, so yeah, so this is the takeaway from how you would do coherent thermodynamics, what you would require. You always require a coherent work. So, so for example, when people, when you say, oh, I'm in the lab and I want to raise um, the state of a system from its ground to excited state, what one way of doing this is, oh, well, I, let's say I shine a laser of that transition on it. But what am I doing there? My laser is a coherent work source. It's, it's a coherent driving mechanism. So it's, it has that form. It's a superposition of many energy eigenstates, which is why it can raise the weight of the, of the little system that I have without really feeling any difference in the laser itself because it's, it's macroscopic. It has a huge amount of energy and so a very wide distribution of our energy states. So whenever you think of those, of those transformations, you can see that this is what is happening. I have one source of coherence, which is able to then manipulate the coherence on, a, on another system. Um, yes, very good. Are there any questions? None. Okay, so in that case, uh, yeah, this will conclude the thermodynamics part. Um, yeah, so if you have now, so now that the thermodynamics part is over, if you have any specific questions about something that we did in the lecture, um, also if, if there are any gaps in the lecture notes, I'm not aware of any so far, but if there are any gaps in the lecture notes, 
Um, let me know about it. Of course, as, as I said, the typicality and equilibration part are only references, but the rest should be represented somehow in the lecture notes. Then, um, yeah, then you can let me know about it. Um, and yes, other than that, thank you very much. And we conclude the lecture five minutes early. <laughs>